Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... <sighs> Y'all, it is hotter than a fart from Satan's asshole outside. And with the weather being as smoldering as what it is, my original plan was to read some satanic-based horror novels for August, and I was going to call it my Hotter Than Hell lineup, but I just really wanted to read some werewolf novels instead. So for this reason, I went to my bookshelf and was looking through the books I've yet to read, and this is when I discovered I've never read the trilogy The Howling by Gary Bradner. And, I mean, I've seen the movies a million times, and I've enjoyed the movies, even the crappy ones, but for some reason I've just never read the books. So, I decided what better time than now to increase my street cred in regards to werewolf literature. And to give you a heads up, I really did enjoy the trilogy, so for the next few weeks I will be reviewing that series. So, if you like werewolves, you're in for a treat. But, also, I want to comment on what's going on here. Pretty much, if you haven't figured it out, the werewolf is my spirit animal. It truly, truly is. And even though we don't have a full moon at the moment, we can just pretend that this is the result of what happened when Carrie decided to moon me. And that's just what we're going to go with. But aside from all of that, let's go on and get down to the horror classic that had gore hounds wagging their tails left and right in the 70s. The opening of The Howling by Gary Bradner presents a historic village that existed around 400 years ago. And as I read this, I kind of felt like there were similarities between this and the Salem Witch Trials, but the only difference is, instead of witches, we have werewolves. Now, after a bloody past has been established, we fast forward to current time, which, because of this book being written in the late 1970s, current time, of course, is the late 1970s. Well, at this point, we become introduced to a married couple by the name of Roy and Karen, and we get the idea that they're middle-class persons due to their professions and also the apartment complex they live in. But one day, while Roy is tending to business in town, the groundskeeper for this complex ends up weaseling his way into their apartment where he rapes Karen. So after this goes down, Karen is trying to become in a good place once again, where she's going to group therapy and she's doing everything necessary to be able to advance. Well, as she's doing this, Roy discovers there's this quaint little village nearby called Drago, and he feels that a change of scenery will do Karen good. So, for this reason, he ends up renting a cabin in Drago, and when they arrive, they discover the village is not too far from becoming a ghost town, but everyone there is really sweet, so because of this, they get settled in quickly. But over the next few nights, Karen really cannot sleep because there's this howling that's going on outside of their rental. And as we continue reading, we discover that as long as Karen and Roy are in Drago, they are literally sitting ducks. When Gary Brandner pitched The Howling, his agent wasn't pleased with the idea. Regardless, he continued forward and sold The Howling upon the publisher's first read. After its release, The Howling became a critical success and it reinvented the werewolf subgenre. From here, the novel gained such popularity that Joe Dante directed the movie adaptation less than five years later. In the past, Brandner said when writing The Howling, he tapped into his childhood fandom for Universal Monsters. Also, he referenced Montague Summers' book The Werewolf, which regards true cases from the Middle Ages. And when asked how he came up with the village of Drago, his reply was, In my own fevered brain one night when the moon was full. Fun facts. Here's a few things you might not know about Gary Brandner. Prior to writing fiction, Gary Brandner was an advertising copywriter and a technical writer. Also, spanning his career, he wrote over 30 novels, 100 short stories, and a few screenplays. 
As far as being involved with the movie adaptation of The Howling, after selling the book rights, his novel was at the mercy of screenwriters, and although he and Dante didn't see eye to eye on the movie adaptation, he felt Dante made a good movie. Nonetheless, Brandner expressed in the past that he wished the movie would have honored the book more. Now, for a sad fact. Unfortunately, Gary Brandner passed away in 2013 from esophageal cancer. Now that we have that out of the way, it's time to move on to the spoilers section of this video, which if you've never read this book before, you might want to skip out on this section, which all you have to do is just scroll down to the comment section of this video, and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top with a timestamp inside of it. All you have to do is just click that timestamp, and it will direct you away from the spoiler section and bring you to the thought section of this video. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone has had the opportunity to click away, I want to discuss a few moments that really stood out to me. First off, I want to talk about how Karen reacted when she saw her first werewolf. And this all comes about because while she's napping alone at the cabin, something awakens her from outside because it's creeping around. So she gets up to investigate, and when she opens the front door, a werewolf goes charging at her. However, she doesn't freak out. Instead, she grabs a gun and shoots the werewolf, and the werewolf runs off. Which, the only reason why the werewolf didn't die is because she didn't use a silver bullet. But what I like so much about this scene is, it shows how Karen has grown as a character, because up until this point, it really felt like she was a victim. However, the second she stands her ground, it really elevates her and lets me know that she's ready to fight back. So that was pretty awesome. The second scene I want to talk about is when her friend by the name of Inez gets killed. And truth be it, Inez and Karen were friends simply for the fact that Inez realized there was a werewolf in Drago and she was trying to warn Karen about what was going on. However, Inez did not realize Drago was actually a werewolf community. And as soon as she finds this out, she drives over to the cabin to warn Karen, but on her way over, she sees Roy. And since it's late at night and dangerous and she trusts Roy, she opens up the car door for him to get in, and as soon as he does, he turns into a wolf and rips her throat out. Which, when I was reading this, I was like, no, don't do it, he's a werewolf! But, I mean, seriously, as a reader, all you can do is just sit back and let it happen, so that was pretty cool. Now, overall, I really love the end of this book, and I say that because so much shit goes down all at once. Like, it's just, it's intense. It is really, truly intense. And what goes on is, you have where Karen has gone into town, and she's gotten a call out to her friend Chris, and she's told him to come rescue her and bring some silver bullets, but in the meantime, she goes back to the cabin and waits for him to show up. Well, night falls, and she starts to hear something outside. So she goes to investigate, and she sees that it's Roy who is starting to transform. Well, while this is happening, a wolf charges at her, and she runs to their truck and locks herself inside. Which, it's a good thing she did, because as soon as she locked the door, the werewolf was trying to open the door with its jaws. And I was like, oh, that's pretty kick-ass. But... As this is all going on, she finally gets her shit together and drives into town where she accidentally wrecks the truck. And this is when she discovers she is, in fact, in a werewolf community. And at this time, she thinks that the only person she can trust is the Doctor of Drago because he's yet to change and he's yet to be a suspicious character. So she goes to him for help and he takes her back to her cabin where the cabin then becomes surrounded by werewolves and she discovers he is in fact a werewolf as well. So she's in a scenario where you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. But while she's trapped, Roy breaks through one of the windows and is 
this wolf form and he tries to defend her. Meanwhile, you have Chris who finally arrives with like guns blazing and even though he takes out quite a few werewolves, he runs out of silver bullets. So they do the next reasonable thing which is make a torch and they just torch the hell out of Drago and get the hell away. So yes, as I said, it was a very intense kick-ass ending and truth be it, it's probably one of the most intense endings I've read this year. I want to use this opportunity to bitch about Roy, because had there ever been a misogynistic asshole to grace the page, it was this douchebag. Now, let me paint the picture for you here. Okay, so his wife got raped, and she also miscarried because of that rape, and he can tell that she totally needs to be able to recover in a new place, so he gets them this cabin in Drago where they can just chill out and try to get back to their normal pattern of life. And yeah, that's cool and everything. He's doing what he should for her. He's trying to nurture her and help her grow and help her get over this tragedy. However, as soon as they get to the cabin, this is where his assholeism comes out. Because for some ungodly reason, he thinks that she ought to be putting out every moment of the day and night. And the thing is, every time she turns him down, he throws this little bitch fit because he can't comprehend she has PTSD. And then to make matters worse, what he ends up doing is he goes to the village, has sex with the village homewrecker, and becomes a werewolf because of it. So I was like, dude, did you really have to be that much of an asshole? Couldn't you have just gone to the bathroom and rubbed one out in private? But, you know... Even though he was a total douche, he did at least come in handy at the end of the book when he tried to save her life. For those who have seen the Howling movies but have never read the book, I can honestly say the fourth movie is the only one that was true to the novel. Now, with the first movie, there are similarities between movie and book, but there's still enough differences where they just stand on their own. And while I'm comparing movie and book, I just want to note that the creature feature aspect of the werewolf that we see in the movie is not in the book, which the werewolves in the novel actually feel more like just typical wolves. They are a little bit bigger than a wolf, but at the end of the day, they're typically just big wolves. And as far as predictability is concerned, I did feel like there were some predictable parts to this, which I chalk that up as having seen all of the movies and kind of knowing what to expect. But had I not seen the movies, I really think that the twist ending would have shocked me. And I do feel like The Howling is a very good groundbreaking novel for werewolf literature. Plus, I feel it's very iconic. Now, as far as character development is concerned, I feel that Karen and Roy really did not have that much of a range. I think that a little bit more character development could have been invested in them, but at the same time, this feels like a pulp novel. And for that reason, it feels like it just kind of moves along fast in regards to character development. Now, even though it does feel pulpy, the book does present some pretty important subjects, such as PTSD and infidelity, which we see PTSD comes into play because Karen has survived her rape and the mindset she's in after that. But infidelity comes into play when Roy can no longer have sex with his wife because she's trying to mentally heal. And this really presents subjects for the reader to discuss with others who have read this book. Now, I really feel like the book was also metaphoric, and I could be looking too deeply into this, but I couldn't unsee it after I saw this. Pretty much, Karen and Roy are middle-class persons, and when they get to Drago, the village and people of that village are anything but middle class, and they are totally lower on the socioeconomic ladder. 
Well, how everything comes into play, we see that Roy and Karen are just shacked up in a cabin while all of these werewolves are trying to tear their lives apart and separate them. So I couldn't help but feel that maybe the author was trying to say middle class persons view those who are not as privileged as being nothing more than wolves trying to take everything from them. And I could be wrong on that, but that's how I saw it. And with that aside, I did not feel afraid when I read this book. Like, it did not scare me. It didn't creep me out. But it was very suspenseful, and I could not put it down. So, at the end of the day, I was entertained, and truth be it, that's all that matters. The Howling by Gary Bradner is a fun, suspenseful horror novel that kept me on the edge of my seat. And if you're the type of horror fan who likes suspense over gore, then this is totally the book for you because it does not dwell on gore or even some of the more intense scenes. And overall, yes, I highly recommend this book. It's something that was really entertaining, and I probably read it in about two, three days, which as you can see, it's not that thick of a book. But I read it within two to three days, and I enjoyed it from beginning to end. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a horror book you would recommend about werewolves? Load up the comments. My second question is, do you believe in werewolves? Why or why not? Personally, I do believe in werewolves, but I don't believe a person can physically transform into a werewolf or a wolf-like hybrid. What I mean by my answer is, I understand there is a mental disorder out there called lycanthropy, and people who suffer from this disorder believe that they can change into a werewolf or a wolf-like creature. So, from the psychological aspect, yes, I do believe in that mental illness. Now, throughout the years, I've discovered that there is an actual werewolf religion, and practitioners do call themselves werewolves. And even though I haven't done a lot of research on this religion, it seems like their basics are social Darwinism, and it seems like there's a blend of witchcraft, demonology, and neo-paganism that goes along with it. But feel free to load up the comments on if you believe in werewolves or not, and also feel free to elaborate on that religion if you have any information that can show some insight. But with that said, let's go in and close out the video, which before I do, I want to say thank you to Lisa G., Joseph Baylot, and Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo is an author who writes fantasy fiction and historic fantasy fiction, so be sure to check out her books. They're available in print and ebook, and I believe you can get them wherever books are sold. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they have been contributing to my Patreon account. And if you would like to contribute as well, just go to the description section of this video, click on the link I provided for Patreon, and for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos. And there is another tier where it's $10 a month, which if you would like to do this, I'll still give you the shout out. But at the beginning of every month, I'll also send you over a photograph, which I do creepy photography on the side. So I'll send you one photo a month and you can print it, do whatever you want with it. It's your photo after that. But also, if you would like to connect with me on social media, links for my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this video as well, so feel free to hit me up. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, be sure to subscribe and click that notifications bell because I have tons of more book reviews coming in the near future. But until we see each other again, I hope you have a wonderful week and sweet nightmares.